So while all this was happening, I met uh, this lady, Paula Newby Fraser, and she spoke to me in the 1980s. She'd just come to America. She won her first Ironman. And she asked me, she said, Tim, I've read about these high fat diets. What do you think I should do? And I supposedly told her that I think it's a very good idea that you eat a high fat diet. And I don't remember saying it, but in, her, in anything she writes, she says, the most important thing in my whole career was being told by Tim Noakes to eat a high fat diet. <laughs> so, and what happened? She won 28 Ironman triathlons and she was a, named the triathlete of the millennium. And she's followed a low carb diet, and she's still at 50, she looks amazing. And she's still, her performance, her athletic performance is astonishing for a 50 year old. So the greatest triathlete of all time has been on a high fat diet and she will easily tell you that. What about Mark Allen, who was her male equivalent and who also won six Ironmen and for 14 years totally dominated the sport. He said, I didn't do well on a high carb diet. It seemed like it was too low in protein. And I personally need a little more fat than Pritikin. Pritikin was a very low fat diet, was saying. And so I didn't really tell people how I ate because it was contrary to what was popular in the 80s. He was too scared to say what he was actually eating. Today, I think people won't tell you because they know they've got an advantage. So they won't tell you the truth. So for me, the 40% fat, 30 carbohydrate, 30 protein was the ideal diet. Now, the interesting thing about Mark Allen was that in his greatest race, he ran a 239 marathon at the finish. So he ran, swam for 40 minutes, cycled for four and a half hours, and then he ran a 239 marathon in midday heat in Hawaii. And so I tried to work out, well, how could you possibly run that, that speed when I know from my own experiments that four and a half hours cycling completely depletes your glycogen in your muscles. So he had to start this race glycogen depleted, and yet he could run a 239. So we made some calculations, and these are in law of running. And we said, if you want to run a three hour 30 marathon, you have to produce 58 kilojoules per minute. Where would it come from? Come from glucose, lactate, and fat. And these are the maximum rates that we could calculate would be present in a person who's already run exercise for four and a half hours. So if we were to run a three and a half hour marathon, he must be burning 0.76 grams of fat per minute. If he, to run a three hour marathon, it must now become 0.91 grams. And if it was to run a, the marathon in two hours 40, he'd have to be burning about 1.2 grams per minute. And we had never ever measured such high values in the laboratory, but we'd never studied fat adapted athletes. And so the prediction from this model was very simple, that he would have to be burning uh, fat at about 50% higher if he wanted to run that 50 minutes faster. So to run 50 minutes faster, he had to burn fat 50% faster than if he was running slower. And Jeff Ehrlich has recently, and I think um, we, we heard about this from Steve just, just a few minutes ago, Jeff Ehrlich has recently shown that fat adapted elite ultramarathon runners can oxidize fat at exactly that value that we calculated he would need to. And they've also shown that you can actually, these guys can burn 1.7 grams per minute. So, so what that tells us is that if you're fully fat adapted, you can run really fast. And if you, you can run a 240 marathon or faster which is astonishing. And it means that people who are running four or five hours in marathons, you know, the fat adaptation would probably be more than they need. But the reality is there must be an exercise duration for which fat adaptation is the preferred state for optimal performance. And I don't know if we found it yet, but what I've tried to show you is that fat adaptation is enough to allow you to run really fast in events, much faster than most people are able to do. So, I then, with Jeff and Steve, who's these two fabulous books, you will have heard of, about them, we wrote a review recently, an editorial, and we found that this was the finding. There have been 11 studies of high-fat diets, of which I've done, we've done about four, I think, and Steve have done a couple, and there are only a few other laboratories in the whole world who've ever done them, so there's 11 studies total. And three showed a significant positive effect, and I've shown you two of them which I'm very dubious about, so please understand that. 
Four showed a non-significant effect favoring the low carbohydrate group, two no effect, and a further two showing a clearly negative outcome. So, and I think there's a real concern about the placebo effect because you know if you're eating the high fat diet. And if you believe the high fat diet will make you perform better, you will perform better. And so I don't know how we ever control for the placebo. But what my point is that even on these inadequate studies, they certainly don't suggest that a, that a high fat diet's a problem. And that this, so therefore there must be some value to them. And, and we made the final point, as there are no studies of the effects of low carbohydrate diets on the ease of weight control. And that's what people tell you, it's so easy for me to control my weight. Capacity to train and the ability to recover from training. If you like this video, please subscribe and share this video on social media and consider donating to my Ko-Fi account.